you for uh, having us. We look forward to uh, helping you all when it comes to co-parenting or helping your children adjust to the whole co-parenting, to households or transitioning days um, and helping your children really adjust to um, what that environment looks like. Uh, we're gonna get started with the first topic of this evening in terms of how to respond to a combative co-parent. So a lot of times co-parenting communication can be quite a challenge and we see that this happens to be a lot after we've had, after parenting plans are put into place because a lot of parenting plans don't necessarily color, cover the communication technicalities or healthy boundaries around communication. And that's where a lot of friction can happen after divorce um, when we're having to converse back and forth in order to meet the children's needs. And a lot of times too, we can still be in that mindset of the marital relationship versus transitioning mentally over to a co-parenting relationship. Right, so when it comes to that transition, the co-parenting communication dynamic needs to shift in order to eliminate any sort of power struggles that may have been present in the marital relationship. So we wanna be more or less matter of a fact. It almost becomes like a business type of communication and we're in the business of raising children together. So and just like you would in terms of functionality when it comes to potentially like work agreements or communication, you're sticking to the facts and you're sticking to the goal of what needs to happen in terms of creating those solutions. So we're kind of adjusting that same business-like mentality when it comes to meeting the children's needs. So your children are becoming more or less the focus of this transaction back and forth. And so the communication no longer really focuses on you or on your ex and about who's doing what right or wrong. We're not attacking or criticizing parenting, but we're figuring out how we're meeting those children's needs. Okay, so we're going to focus on the four C's of communication for co-parenting. The first one is going to be calm tone of voice. And the reason we want to use a calm tone of voice is because if we use any type of communication that causes conflict, such as heightened emotion, we're not going to be able to solve the problem that we're facing with our co-parent. So using that calm tone of voice it can actually really help. And actually 90% of tone of voice is actually going to impact whether or not your co-parent is going to work with you or more or less deflect or uh, dismiss whatever the conversation that you're having with them, where 10% of actually leads to high, higher conflict. So if we have a lower tone of voice, very assertive, but low tone of voice, we're more likely to get a better response. We're also going to use a concise message because if we go on a tangent or send them a book because we're so fueled up, our message of what we want to happen is going to go out the window. So we're kind of eliminating that emotional style of communication Correct. of going on rants or tangents, or even if they're like infuriating you, we have to think, oh, is this going to benefit my children? Most likely the answer is no. So that's why we want to stick to very concise messaging so we can get to the end result of what we're trying to achieve. And the third C is using constructive communication. Once again, we're trying to strive for a win-win outcome. So being constructive and positive is going to allow us to get a positive outcome. If we start by blaming or attacking because we're so upset, we're more likely going to end up with a negative result because we started with a negative. So even though you guys are on different pages, you're not seeing eye to eye in regards to what it is that you need to solve, that's okay. But learning to be constructive, and we're gonna get into how to do that by using discovery questions is gonna allow us to be able to engage a more hopefully constructive conversation, which eliminates stress on both ends of for both parties. So you might paraphrase in those situations like it, Instead of just saying like, no, I'm not going to do that and shutting down their idea, you might say, it seems like we're on two different pages right now in terms of what we want to happen, or it seems like we're not aligning. Can you help me further understand what it is that you're looking for or how you'd like to propose a solution? So we're, we're actually addressing the behavior versus saying, no, you're wrong, or no, that's not right. That's not what we're doing. That doesn't benefit our child. I can't believe you parent that way. We want to eliminate all that and just address the behavior, what we're experiencing, or does it, or you might say, I'm not 
or you might say it seems there's a lack of communication. So we're addressing the behavior of what's going on, not the person. Yeah. And the fourth C is being children centered. So all of our conversation wants to be focused around the children. So that way it's not about you versus your co-parent, it's we versus our co-parenting relationship. So we want to use that we mindset, which is going to help us really focus on our children, because like she said, we're in business to support our children's well-being and help them thrive in the transition from home to home. Mm -hmm. And so when we're trying to address issues between our co-parent, using discovery questions, what we like to call them, helps us gain insight at, from the other person's perspective. So versus saying, it's very common to be like, well, why would you say that? Or why would you do that? Why questions put somebody on the defense. They feel like they're doing something wrong. And so they're going to come back at you very defensive. Mm -hmm. So we want to eliminate why questions. Instead, we want to like, can you help me understand how come you, how come you chose to do X, Y, and Z? So we're trying to gain insight or discover their perspective or their thought process around the decision they made for the child or the ch children or the decision that they're trying to make moving forward. So we want to, again, we want to understand their thought process by asking how come or what about that choice do you think benefits our children? So the more we understand our co-parent and insight to their perspective, the easier it is for us to bridge the gap between opposing perspectives. Correct. And I think too, it allows us to have more of an engaging, constructive conversation because we're also, we're not assuming, we're assessing. If we assess, we lead to progress and success. If we assume, we're more likely to be doomed because we cannot actually solve a problem without the information that we need based on our co-parents' beliefs or values, because that's the information we're trying to gain because our beliefs is what lead to behaviors. So if their behaviors seem irrational or you know upsetting or concerning for your children's well-being, we need to understand their beliefs behind why they chose that behavior without mm -hmm. asking why. <laughs> why is a big no-no. Yes. All right, uh, moving along. So now we're gonna talk about how to establish boundaries with your co-parent. And any relationship, more or less needs boundaries in order to thrive. So whether it's whether it's in a current marital uh, relationship you're in, like a happy and healthy one, or whether it's in one with you know your ex, you need boundaries no matter what in order to have a healthy relationship thrive. So the boundaries give us clarity. There's a lot of misconception about boundaries actually. So let me clear that up first. So a lot of times people think boundaries are actually ultimatums. Ultimatums are a one-sided viewpoint or perspective, such as you must do this or else. So that's like, it's a threatening language. And more than likely, every time you're going to be met by resistance when we use threatening language or ultimatums. Boundaries are actually a two-sided two perspective that allow us to form unity within those two different perspectives and come together based on a value system. So... And the difference between boundaries is we're actually going to ask our co-parent to work with us versus demand that they work with us. That's the biggest difference is asking versus telling or demanding. So whenever we feel like a boundary has been violated, so we want to understand that emotion. What is going on that they're not meeting your child's needs? What is your co-parent doing that's upsetting you? Perhaps they're not communicating, responding to an email or a text or a message on an app. Or maybe they have um, left the child's belongings at their house and these are belongings that need to go back and forth each week or each day during the transition, um, such as the school, the, your child's schoolwork or their book bag, things of that nature. And so we, when we identify what that emotion is, by labeling it, that's going to help us remove the emotion from it when we go to set the boundary because we want to label the problem. What's missing from the situation or what's been violated, something that you value, such as communication, and we want to identify that. Once we identify the, that value or the problem, then we are going to move forward and then we want to be able to stick to the facts when it comes to setting the boundary. We want to move all emotion because we want to be very clear. And the more, the less words we can use to set a boundary, the better off we're going to um, have our co-parent understand where we're coming from. 
Right, so say there happens to be a disconnect in terms of communication about the children's needs and your ex is like stonewalling you or shutting you out from trying to meet the child's needs. Um, in that instance, we're gonna say, can you help me understand how come there's a lack of communication? I value communication. How can we work on communicating better in order to meet our child's needs? So we're asking them to propose a solution in that instance in order to, and you're letting them know that you value communication versus saying to them, how come you're ignoring me? Or why are you not responding? I need the kids X, Y, Z. Like, so that more likely they're just gonna keep stonewalling if we're attacking them. So instead we're trying to propose coming up with a solution as to what type of, what the communication looks like. How often are you guys communicating? Do you just communicate via email once a week? Do you communicate on a daily basis via text message? In terms of mod, and like the, the less you communicate actually in a co-parenting situation, sometimes it's, the, it's better because mm -hmm. it also helps minimize the discord or the chaos that can erupt from miscommunication or feeling frustrated with somebody who struggles to communicate. Um, a lot of times, when someone struggles with communication in general, it's because there's a personality disorder that's present. So that that person struggles with communication because they didn't know how to communicate as a child in their own life, which is what's resulted in the personality disorder we have today. So it became a defense mechanism for their own childhood wounds that they have yet to heal from. And so that's what makes communication generally a problem today in, their, in a co-parenting situation. Yeah. Another way to set a boundary too, you could say it seems or it appears that we're not seeing eye to eye in regards to the children's belongings. I value the kids having their things. How can we work on this moving forward? And you always want to end with a discovery question, which is an open-ended question, because you're looking for them to provide some bit of solution and the reason we want them to talk first is because once again, we're learning about their insight as to how come they have not been able to return the children's belongings or how come they're not responding to our message. And the whole point is to come up with a solution, a plan of action that can be put into place to hold both parents accountable or to have integrity in terms of meeting the children's needs. So the boundary is to create a plan of action that we hold each parent accountable to as in a more or less a contracted agreement. Correct. And also in the same sense, you might negotiate back and forth with your co-parent on that solution. It may not work the first time, but the reason why we want to negotiate is to come up with a plan. And once again, once that plan is in place, let's say they violate that plan again, then we're going to have to start setting a boundary again. And sometimes we need to be patient and give this person an opportunity two or three times to try to get the boundary in place. Because we have to think someone's may be operating a certain way for 20, 30, 40 years. So they're not going to change that pattern immediately overnight. So it is a process and we want to find our like gratitude and our patience during that transitional period of when we do start to set boundaries, because it's going to be a new quote unquote foreign language for all parties such as yourself and for our co-parent when we're trying to make a change in the co-parenting relationship. But it's us up to us to implement that boundary and uphold it. It's our own responsibility. Just like like she said, we can't just we can't always just set it once and expect it to automatically get um, executed every single time. So sometimes we do have to establish them multiple times in order to find out the resistance to meeting that need. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions about boundaries, why we're talking about them? We can get into it later too at the end of this, um, but if there's anything quick, we could answer a question on boundaries right now. Uh, just drop, drop a message in the chat box, um, but we do see other messages coming in, so we will answer them at the end, just so you know that we are aware there. So what if they won't stay within those boundaries? So the boundaries are about setting, you guys coming up with a solution together. The whole reason we wanna ask them how to solve the problem is so that they'll abide by the boundary that they provide a solution for. So if they say, you know, I'll do, I'll communicate once a week, Mondays at, you know, 7 p.m. And if they don't stick to that boundary, then we can say, um, help me understand how come we're not, you know, maintaining our 7 p.m. Monday night boundary that we established. And so they may say, 
oh, I forgot about it or, you know, it doesn't work for me anymore. I'm like, okay, great. In order for us to be able to focus on our children, what's the best time and day that you think is going to work so we can stick to that? Because I, you know, would pr I like having a routine schedule to support our children's needs. And so you might have to renegotiate boundaries, boundaries because they're going to struggle with maintaining them. You're absolutely correct because it's going to be new. And most of the time, the reason why, why you got a divorce is because they didn't respect your boundaries or your needs in the first place in the marital relationship. So it's going to take a little bit of practice in terms of how to set them in the new co-parenting relationship. Um, someone's asking, how do you address the open-ended questions regarding missing items? So you might ask, um, I noticed or the children went to your house with X, Y, Z, all the different items you might list. Can you help me understand how we can get those items returned because they need them for usage at my house? So we're asking about asking them, giving them a list of those items and ask how they can get returned. Most parenting plans nowadays will or at least we recommend when creating the parenting plan to establish a timeline of when those items need to be returned that go back and forth. So we would send the parent a list in advance before they were to return the children or before they go back to school the next day. And that list of those items that would need to go in their backpack or would need to be dropped off on the exchange time and day. Um, the reason why we do this, because yes, things can get misplaced or people can forget items. So it's just a simple reminder to send a list but also in your parenting plan, it might say that the items that were um, left or went to the other parent's house need to be returned by the next exchange day um, to the other home. And sometimes if parents are not going to return items, then it may be that it needs to be in your parenting plan that says that they, if say a certain amount of time's gone by and you've requested these items two or three times or not being re, they're not being returned, then it might be that you request reimbursement from the parent who is neglecting to return the child's items. Okay, um, we're gonna keep moving along here and then we'll get to the other questions later. Um, so next we're gonna be talking about what helps children on transition days. So a lot of times children can have more behavioral problems than emotional problems when there's transition days. Um, it's because they haven't developed the language to verbally express what they're feeling or the confusion or the frustration or anger they might be going through. So sometimes they act out. Their behaviors are really a clear indication to us that something is bothering them internally. And so we really need to be observant of our children's behaviors to really understand them. Um, some things that have, that can help with transition days is understanding your child's love language. So do they like affirmation? Do they like quality time? Do they like um, touch? Like, do they like hugs when they come back? What makes them feel loved and good inside, feel good emotions to spend time in your home with them? Yeah, in order to figure out your child's love language, if you're not familiar, um, you can go to five love, love oh, excuse me, five lovelanguages.com and you can have your children take the quiz. Um, and it'll be fun. It's a fun activity you can do it, you know, together and finding out what they really like. Because like she said, if they like quality time, words of affirmations, then you can use those tools to your advantage during transition periods to ease in the discomfort that they may be experiencing when they're going from one house to the next. Sometimes it's also beneficial when they're coming from the other household is to do an active, spend quality time with them and do an activity with them, like maybe color together, maybe paint together, um, maybe cook in the kitchen together. Again, this depends on the age of the child. Um, it could be reading a book together or playing, playing a game in the living room. It depends again on the age of the child, but just engaging with them and spending quality time with them will make them feel loved. And children thrive on the feeling of consistency, love, um, safe, security. That's what they need in their environment to thrive. So figure out what activity they enjoy doing together and maybe do that activity when they come back from the other parent's house. Also too, another way of helping children is helping them either do grounding or meditation, things of that nature as well, where you can do it as a family whenever they come over, just in towards like recentering, 
can be a great way to help them emotionally be able to transition. And so it's a lot of times grounding for a child is like sitting on the ground, Indian style, Indian style. Well, I know it's winter, so you can do this inside or you can go outside and put their feet in the grass and just have a fun, you know, walk around um, for five to 10 minutes because it can just be really helpful to help them recenter. Um, or you can do like the five finger meditation where you can have your children breathe in, breathe out, in, and you just have them do this until they, you know, get to that calm state. And that can just really help them feel more at ease because they're doing that activity, but then they're also helping center their nervous system. Mm -hmm. So they're less likely to have those emotional outbursts or kicking their feet, having a temper tantrum because they feel like not wanting to be at your house or they want to be at the other parents or they want to be at school or wherever they want to be because they're just having a tough time during that transition. Also, sometimes making their favorite snack or having a cup of tea can also be a great way to engage with your child when they come back from the other home and just having a simple lighthearted conversation so they know that you are there for them and are willing to openly listen to maybe anything that they're experiencing or that they want to talk about. Yeah. And I think too, like getting kids involved in doing something in an activity just is really helpful because then they're going to forget about that transitional period much easier and just adapt well to a new environment. Right. Okay, moving along, we're going to talk about some self-love coping mechanisms. This is for parents and parents and kids can do together. So um, she mentioned like five finger meditation for kids. Um, also deep belly breathing, this is good for parents or for children. So this can be something you guys can practice together. Um, with a child, you might want to explain to them that taking a deep breath in and then blow their belly out to the biggest balloon that they can create. So we're making a balloon with our belly. So we can make this very fun. And like, again, it's regulating this emotional nervous system and de-stressing. But this is also really helpful for adults as well. I um, I can't emphasize this enough when it comes to, this is one of the things I personally practice in my own life is deep breathing exercises because um, it allows us to let go. Think of everything, the frustration or the anger, or the emotions that you want to let go that is going on in your life when you breathe out. So this is helping us release built up emotion so it doesn't harbor in our body with resentment or anger on a regular basis because only we can truly heal ourselves from the inside externally, nothing we can really do is going to prevent that healing that we get from ourselves. Yeah. And another activity that you can do with your child can either be journaling or coloring, depending on their age. So um, a lot of times having adult coloring book, and then you have your child has a coloring book, you guys can color together. And a lot, you know, being able to just color can be really relaxing. You can put on some music, you can share a cup of hot cocoa or, um, like she said, this is, want, yeah, this is a great tool for reducing anxiety. Yeah. And then, or you could do even journaling where each you have your, you have your notebook and paper and then your child has like a crown and a notebook or paper. And then just having fun and just like writing for like five minutes, 10 minutes can just be really helpful for both you and your child, but you're teaching them how to take care of themselves and process their emotions even if they can't actually write words. The process itself can be really helpful in getting them in that daily habit because we wanna have them learn positive things that are gonna help them as they start to age and go through these developmental years and start to learn more about their body, their mind and how things, you know, they, what they feel. Um, so the sooner we learn these types of activities, the better off they're going to be and thrive. And, you know, divorce is not what causes kids to be, um, distraught and you know whenever it's about how we parent our children in order to give them that place of thriving that's going to impact how they um perform and grow up in life we're children of divorce and we're you know a great example of just really feeling like there can be a positive experience too yeah so journaling helps with the emotional regulation and helps give you clarity in your life and the direction you where you're at right now today, but also maybe where you want to go. So journaling just more of like free flow writing. There's no like right or wrong way yeah. to journal. It's more or less like, how did I feel today? What did I learn about myself today? 
what, what are maybe three goals I have for myself tomorrow that I want to achieve? Because it can be just very small goals. Also, maybe three I believe statements or I am statements about myself. I believe I'm a great mom or I believe I'm a great dad. So it can be very simple, but just more or less your statements of um, affirmations, maybe three goals, um, just more or less flowing of what you need or what did your co-parent do that frustrated you? Get yeah. it out on paper. Putting that so it doesn't on paper. Yeah. So it doesn't come out when you interact with the children or when you have to interact with your co-parent mm-hmm. again. So you're getting rid of all the negative toxicity of emotions that are boiling up inside of you out onto the paper and releasing it. Yeah. And maybe there's something that's like troubling you or something that you just can't pinpoint or put your finger on it. If you journal about that, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes a day, whether it's morning or evening, whatever works best for you as a parent, um, you can typically go back and read your journal entries like a week or two later. And you're probably going to find that answer that you're looking for because you're going to start to see a pattern in your journal entries that are going to give you some insight into what direction or better judgment you need to have making a decision going forward. But to answer your question about expanding the journal together with your child, it's about you know showing that you're modeling positive behavior for your child. You're teaching them we're having a tough time. So let's color together or let's, you know, write or draw. And you're doing something to help them see that if we're having a tough time, we can put our emotions on paper to alleviate whatever we're feeling. And so sometimes it's better to do an activity like that than put them in a timeout because the timeout doesn't teach them how to process their emotions. It's almost like you're punishing a child for having emotions. So doing a positive activity teaches them how to process their emotions and this is a great way to implement that. Right. Um, also, in terms of, you can incorporate at the family dinner table positive affirmations or gratitudes. Mm-hmm. So everybody can go around the dinner table and say, I'm grateful for the sun is shining today, or I'm grateful that I have a loving mommy or a loving daddy, or I'm grateful that we have a nice meal on the table. So we're teaching kids gratitude. Gratitude is a way to happiness because when we are grateful for the things that we have and we can appreciate what we have in our life it allows us to be present in the moment and that's where we find our happiness yeah and I think too it's good for us even as like adults to be able to have those simple reminders so we always say our gratitudes lead to a better attitude and so Once again, whether you do this in the morning when you have your children or in the evening at the dinner table, whatever works best for you, it could be at breakfast or dinner, but this is a good time to connect with your children before the day starts or after the day ends and just really learn about them because it's going to tell you too what basic needs are important to them. What do they enjoy about life? Because a lot of times, you know, children at that early age, they don't know how to express their emotions. They don't know how to tell you when something's wrong. But teaching just basic, simple words of affirmations or gratitudes can be really powerful to their mind set. And we all know how powerful our mind is in terms of leading us to better behaviors as we develop. So, yeah. And also you can, um, like she said, implement this any time of day, but sometimes it's also good to ask your um, kids too, what do you value about your friends? What do you, instead of just saying, how was school today? Because I'm like, Oh, school, you know, they don't always want to answer that question. So you would say, oh, well, what did you and your friend talk about today? Uh, What do you like about your friend? You're learning your child's value system by what they like about their friends and um, why they're choosing those friends. So it's helping you better indirectly understand your child by asking the strategic questions to gain insight into their mindset and what what they what they thrive on and what makes them happy which is going to nurture your relationship with your child so they also too feel safe to express when something isn't good or something Mm -hmm. is wrong because they know that you're less likely going to judge them you're going to be supportive you're going to be understanding you're going to be there because you've already been having these you know conversations and building that deeper connection um, where they feel that they they feel safe and they can trust you And there's nothing wrong if your child is misbehaving, but we need to understand how come they're misbehaving. Like how come they're having these outbursts of anger or um, how come they're like hitting their brother or sister. So timeout is okay if we need to say per their age, it's one minute per age. So if they're five years old, then they go in timeout for five minutes. But like she said, we give them paper to draw. We give them an activity to do. And then we sit and talk about them. 
help me understand how come it's okay. You thought it was okay to hit your sister. So we're, at, we're actually gaining perspective into their um, thought process. And then we teach the bigger picture lesson. We're not just saying to stop hitting your sister. It's not nice to hit your sister. We're saying, does it feel good when we hit people? Do you, does it, I mean, is it upsetting? Is it harmful? Is it hurtful? Do we want to hurt other people? No, we're teaching them big picture lessons to help them understand how to better regulate their behaviors. Yeah. And then we can always ask them too, well, what do we, what could we have done differently? What could we try if, if brother wasn't sharing his toy or sister wasn't, you know, sharing her doll, like what could we have done differently in order to, you know, share toys? You know, can we ask, can we, you know, if that take doesn't turns. work, yeah, can we take turns? Can we, you know, go to mom and say, mom or dad, you know, how we're, we're not green on this. What can we do in this moment? But you're teaching them to advocate and use their voice, which is their most powerful tool versus getting physically, you know, or emotionally really, uh, upset. Yeah. So teaching your child to have an inner voice is one of the most powerful things you can do as a parent. Um, we, without our inner voice, we don't know how to set boundaries. We don't know how to get respect or to feel valued in our lives. It, having an inner voice is teaches a child to believe in themselves, to have confidence in themselves. And that's the most powerful thing you can help your child do. Yeah. So that's why a lot of these, as, these tools, such as journaling, breathing, affirmations, gratitudes, it's a way to really help, you know, the whole entire family dynamic, you know, help the child be able to heal and do certain things that are going to support their well-being. Because like I said, it's not divorce itself that's going to impact your child. It's about what's going on between, you know, in the homes that's going to set your child up for success. Right. Um, all right, the last topic of discussion that we're going to cover tonight before we answer additional questions from you guys is introducing new partners. So when it comes to new partners or one co-parent starting a new relationship, we always recommend that this person, the new partner that's coming to the picture, they be dating for at least six months, if not longer, closer to a year before introducing to the children. The reason why we want to delay introducing new partners to the children is because of their emotional and psychological development. Um, lots of, if we introduce the children to every new partner that we're dating, that can be very conflictual and confusing for the child. And we're bringing people into their lives that may not be in their best interest or healthy for them. So we want to remain that stable, consistent environment for them. Um, so dating someone for six months a year, most likely that's created a stable environment, that relationship, and you feel that that person is a positive impact in your child's life before introducing them. Um, also prior to introducing a new partner to your child, you want to have the biological parent of the co-parent meet this new partner. So the three of you might want to go to like a coffee shop. So both you know, each co-parent along with the new partner would go to like a coffee shop and just get to know each other and just really understand like why this, your, co your co-parent wants to bring this new partner into your child's life. So you're just learning, engaging, learning about, you know, wow, how this person's important to them. And if anything, this person might be a really important person to your co-parent who's going to help with parenting your child. So you really want to get to know them and it might have a positive influence, which can really help create safety um, around your children. A lot of times we work with step parents um, and or the new partner too, and they come part of the co-parenting process because they have such a positive influence on your child more than maybe your co-parent. You never know. Yeah. And then also we want to make sure that the new parent is not going to have any role when it comes to disciplining the children. So their role is to more or less be the adult, but also more like an aunt or an uncle in the picture. So they're there, they can help with like caregiving or babysitting or things of that nature, where they're not there to discipline the children or to give them like rules or chores or things like that within the home. Question from a mother who's asking about um, the father has not seen his child since January 2nd. And when she requests to, when he's going to see him next, um, he will not be seeing him for three weeks. So this would be something that would need to potentially be outlined in your parenting plan when it comes to holidays. The holidays can be a very stressful time when it comes to co-parenting and 
I definitely recommend the holiday schedule be set out in a co. So sometimes when there's the first week, one parent gets a child, the second week of the holiday, the other parent gets the child in order to, um, to, to maximize how the time is being spent when it comes to parenting time. But if, if you guys have an actual coach parenting plan and you guys are on a consistent schedule of that, he sees the child every, you know, every other weekend or sees them on, if you're on a two, two, um, three plan, whatever your plan is, there's so many different variables of co-parenting plans. But if there is a consistent parenting time and he's choosing to forego his parenting time, then it sounds like you may need to potentially update your co-parenting plan mm -hmm. and arrangements for custody if he's choosing to neglect his parental responsibilities. Consistently showing that he doesn't want to spend time with a child, that's ultimately affecting the child's self-esteem and emotional um, so their belief system about themselves and feeling rejected by a parent. When a child feels rejected by a parent, whew, it's just a long lifetime of problems that are going to come up in that child's life. So it's almost to the point we don't want to, we, depending on how the child, how old the child is, we don't want the child to think that their parent is rejecting them maybe he's a, we can, we might need to say maybe he's away at work or something in the meantime until we can figure out what that consistent plan looks like and he's going to fulfill those responsibilities or not. In regards to clothes, this is a big thing that we see a lot with our co-parenting situation. So clothes, a lot of times um, having two sets of clothes or when the kids are at your house, having a set of clothes for them there that they wear when they come to your house. And then you send them back home in the clothes that goes back to, let's say their mom's house. Um, that way we're not having to drag clothes back and forth during a uh, parenting time. Um, sometimes kids are okay with packing a bag as long as items do go back. Um, so it's up to you and your co-parent to figure out what's going to be the best plan in terms of whether it's sharing clothes and taking them back and forth or having separate clothes in each household. Right. Because sometimes if there are, if clothes are going back and forth, sometimes what happens is all the shirts or all the socks end up at one household and then it makes it hard for the other household to function. So sometimes you might have to, um, like, okay, we need to have a, you know, a monthly meeting or a bi-weekly meeting of like, I have all the clothes. What do you need? What do you have at your house? So we need to figure out where all the clothes are going to in order to make sure the child's uh, clothing needs are met in each house. Yeah. And two, and if um, finances, obviously there's a lot of finances involved in co-parenting and divorce cases and things of that nature. So uh, if finances are an issue, you can always like, you know, ask, you know, someone to donate or go to a secondhand store, find ways that you can be able to have just like some basic sets of clothes, you know, at the household um, when they come over. So that way you feel like you can provide and it's not an issue in terms of like having to address this, especially if your co-parent is resistant to working out an agreement that works for both households. New partners can be bonus people, a bonus person in the child's life. Like I said, we've seen a lot of different cases where the new partner becomes a really positive influence on the children. And it's actually been a really fresh breath of air because unfortunately we didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so seeing it today where we have sometimes three parents, four parents, the more parents can sometimes be a win-win outcome for everyone because we're all trying to do what's in the best interest of the children. Yep. So this question is about somebody who doesn't if I understand correctly, doesn't want the relationship to end and they struggle with anxiety when they have to communicate with their ex. Unfortunately, sometimes relationships, so we, first off, relationships are two-sided. Both people have to equally want this relationship to work out in order for it to thrive and be healthy. If one person is choosing that this relationship is no longer for them, is no longer something they want to engage with, unfortunately, it's kind of out of our hands and we have to let that relationship go because otherwise we're holding our own hope and happiness back from being able to find someone that can love us and can meet our needs and does want to be, up, be with us. So children thrive when both parents are happy and healthy, even if that's in their own separate homes. So it sounds like you're struggling to let go of this relationship. When we struggle to let go of what could have been, that's the future that we're living in. 
And that's the vision that we have created that has yet to even, that could have yet to even um, happen. And so when we say in the present moment, we focus on today. Right now, today, you and your ex are not together. Maybe she will have a change of heart, you know, a year or two from now. We don't know. But right now, all we have is the answer is today is that she doesn't want to work on the relationship. So we have to live for today and create that fulfillment and happiness for ourselves from within. And then when you say anxiety, when you have to speak with it right now, your body's in this fight or flight response mode, which can also create more anxiety. And so we want to create safety for yourself when it does come to communicating with her. So I would recommend practice, you know, if you get a message and you, and that message triggers you, what I would recommend doing is taking some time for do some self care, whether it's going on a walk, whether it's, um, going to the gym, whether it's, um, doing a meditation for self, you know, self-love or whether it's journaling, writing, whatever it is, do something for yourself for 10 or 15 minutes to get yourself in a better state of mind before you actually have to respond or communicate with her, because that's going to help remove the trigger of anxiety of whenever you do see her name or her message pop up. So um, the more we can practice taking care of ourselves and get ourselves out of that fight or flight response mode, the easier it's going to be able to communicate because then you're going to feel like you're in control of the situation on your end that supports your health. Somebody's asking about a 50-50 arrangement and that, um, what our viewpoints on that and that someone said it was selfish. I'm not for sure how come somebody would say that it's selfish to be 50-50 and there needs to be a primary home. Absolutely not. Um, it's whatever works for your role. It's whatever works for your co-parenting situation in your custody arrangement. I mean, there's lots of different dynamics and things that happen. Someone might live in another state or country. Somebody might, um, uh, somebody might, um, only not be able to take the kids because of work. They have, they work much longer hours than the other parent. So it's whatever works for your home. What benefits the children the most is that they have two healthy and happy parents. How that time is divided is what um, is beneficial to the children and makes sense to your family. Having a 50-50 is a great arrangement if the children are thriving in both environments. Because obviously our children, their role models are their parents. You guys have the biggest influence on your children out of anybody in their lives. So the more time they can spend with either parent that's positively influential to them, the better. Don't listen to always what everything you read or what everyone else says around you. You have to trust your gut and what works for your family and makes sense to you for the well-being of your children. So whenever your um, ex is being overprotective, of your son, I would recommend using discovery questions to diffuse the aggressiveness and ask how come she is concerned with the way that you are I, I don't know if you're on a walk outside or just out, out having a good time or what something about in the street. Um, but anyways. Whenever, some, whenever our co-parent gets aggressive, one of the easiest ways is to use a discovery question. Oh, just on a walk, okay. One of the easiest ways is to use a discover, discovery question. How come, what concerns you about the way that I'm holding our son? Or help me understand how come this is upsetting to you. And just really use your a discovery question to engage more insight to understand how come is she so upset. It could be she just wants things to be done her way or she could have some concerns in the way things, how she envisions something happening in the future. So she may have anxiety about a futuristic event happening that's getting displaced onto the moment of walking with your son. And so we wanna assess farther to diffuse the conflict by using an open-ended question to gain insight. And that's gonna help to bring down the emotion and just say, help me understand, or I'm confused. like you know, how come this upsets you? I, I really don't understand. Like, can you share more with me? You know, tell me how come this bothers you and just really have more of that empathy voice because your calmness is going to help bring her emotion down so you can have an engaging, constructive conversation.